Greetings and welcome back to another shocking and horrifying episode of Human Monsters Podcast. Thank you once again for the unwavering support you show on such a consistent basis. Even when we sometimes get it wrong, just like everyone else, the Humoa army never holds it against us, and for that we are incredibly grateful. Without your support, your reviews, and the handful of stars we are getting every week, the journey on this strange and dark road of telling tales of the absurd and of the absolute frightening would be a lonely one. Just know we can never thank you enough for the ongoing support. Now let's jump onto the case of another monster, and like me, don't be surprised if you find your jaw dropping every now and then. There is a debate about the reform of a pedophile that just goes round and round. Certain psychologists believe that it's possible to teach child molesters skills and self-control, i.e. not to abuse a child, but personally I don't believe that urge or that need to do the despicable and to ruin a child forever is something you can ever, no matter how much you try, eliminate from that person's psyche. It's a personal belief, and if you disagree, feel free to voice your feelings on the socials, but how are you supposed to get the impulse of a sex offender, especially those who have an attraction to children, out of them? It's not a tangible thing you can remove, unless you want to get medieval and castrate the person, but removing the sex organs does not necessarily remove the primal call a pervert feels to desecrate and destroy the life of another for his or her own temporary pleasure. Chemical castration requires monitoring and many of the methods used have side effects. So what is the solution? Sex offenders are obviously aware that they are at the bottom of the food chain in prisons. Still, they commit their crimes again and again. The threat of appearing on a sex offender registry also seems to be not a huge deterrent in the fact that it restricts them from living where they want to live once released also does not stop anyone from committing the most egregious of crimes if they are so inclined. In the first world, like the USA, Sweden, and other economically and socially stable countries, it's easier to control the scourge of sex offenders. But uh, what about those who live in the third world? In today's episode, we will be covering the case of someone so despicable that it might change your mind, even if you are a staunch supporter against the death penalty. What makes the crimes even more unimaginable is the fact that he had victim counts in the hundreds. It's almost incomprehensible, but this killer and his accomplices had two things in common. They chose children as their victims, and they had absolutely no remorse. There are over 1.5 million street children in Pakistan today. The causes for this are many and varied. Domestic violence, abuse, and poverty are the most common reasons. Some children run away from home just to find food, only to end up having to steal for survival. Many are orphaned with no relatives to take care of them. There are an estimated 3,500 to 5,000 street children living on the streets of Lahore, Pakistan. A disproportionate number of these children use drugs and engage in survival sex as coping mechanisms. Since August 2003, Project SMILE provides mobile social and health services to street children six days a week in selected neighborhoods. This study utilizes data from Project SMILE registration data on the program's initial clients. 
The study aimed to compare current, former, and non-drug users regarding their reasons for living on the streets, survival, and coping mechanisms, and reasons for drug initiation where applicable. Of the total sample, 17% reported never having used drugs, 15.9% reported being former drug users, and 61% reported having used drugs in the month before registration. Participants were 96% boys with a median age of 13 years. The median length of living on the streets was 18 months, and 52.7% had even been arrested by the police. Odd jobs, begging, and pickpocketing were the primary sources of reported income. 48% reported even having engaging in transactional sex, and 40% reported cutting themselves primarily to cope with their anger. Variables that were significantly correlated with being a current drug user in the presence of other variables included being 13 years of age or older, ever exchanging sex for food, shelter, drugs, or money, and ever having cut themselves. Drug use is a major coping mechanism among street children in Lahore and is associated with much behavior. Targeted programs are needed to meet their special needs. Although there is no official report of sexual exploitation of children by international tourists, prostitution of boys takes place at pilgrim and local tourist shrines. Pakistan serves as an origin, transit, and destination country for child trafficking, mostly of girls. Now that you have a little background about the state of child abuse, homelessness, and how disposable the life of a child is in Pakistan, you can only imagine how easy it is for pedophile predators to prey on the underaged in the country. It's the perfect hunting ground. The Monster of Lahore Javed Ekbal Mokhal, also known as Kikri, was born and bred in Lahore in the province of Punjab in Pakistan in 1956. His killing spree would last for a year, from 1998 to 1999, which means he killed and tortured about three children a week. What made him one of the worst child sex abusers is his motive and the unbelievable body count which reached exactly 100 before he gave himself up to authorities. Another fascinating facet is the penalty the judge rendered upon him, but I am going to leave that incredible punishment for last. Let's first get to know the man, the monster, and the megalomaniac that turned the city of Lahore upside down for almost a year. As it is in most third world countries, there is no middle class in Pakistan. Javed was fortunate enough to be born the sixth of eight children to his parents. His father, Muhammad Ali, was a successful businessman and his mother a homemaker and the family wanted for nothing. Javed's father was a refugee from India who had worked hard and acquired his wealth by not letting any opportunities pass him by. To say that Javed was spoiled rotten was the understatement of the year. Javed attended the Government Islamic College and received a proper education as an intermediate student. In 1978, he began a recasting steel business in one of the two villas his father bought his son. One of the very first flags that should have raised concern was that he never had a girlfriend, yet he lived in a villa that his father had purchased for him with a group of boys. He would call the boys his boys and proudly drive around the city with the car loaded with young boys and teenagers. According to his brother, Javid was spoiled as a child and difficult to handle. He was aggressive, selfish, 
and used to kill animals for fun when he was a boy. He was, however, always at the top of his class and presumed to be highly intelligent. Javed never had money problems, nor did he have problems with the law, because his father would pay for everything, including getting his son out of difficult situations. When the steel casting business failed, his father would bankroll another of Javed's business ventures. It was also hardly a secret that the boys that always accompanied Javid and seemed to rotate were paid to keep him company. When anyone would criticize or ask why a grown man was jetting around the city with a bunch of underaged boys in his fancy car, he would just ban them from his home or shun them on the street. Javid would, through the 80s, gather boys by subscribing to teenage magazines and writing to boys, as well as sending them gifts. He also had a video game arcade, and I am sure he often gave tokens for free to have boys he found desirable play and stay. When he started the Sunnyside School for Children, it was not to get the children out of the heat and into an air-conditioned building or out of the goodness of his heart. To Javit, the end game was always sexual abuse, sodomy, and molestation. To get an idea of how easy it is to convince a child of any age to be lured into a predator's clutches, keep in mind that there are almost a million and a half street children in Pakistan alone. Children are unable to have a normal childhood, and hunger is a constant ache that is often exploited by those with means. These children, often as young as three years old, have no education, no protection, and for all intents and purposes, no future. It struck me during an interview with a human rights officer, he referred to the children as nothing more than a piece of tissue paper you blow your nose on and throw away. The life of a child means little there, and sadly, sexual offenders who prefer their prey young have so many to pick from for so little as a piece of bread. Javid was arrested numerous times as parents laid charges of molestation, but Javid's father always had a wad of cash to ensure that his son never paid for his crimes. That was until 1990, when Muhammad died unexpectedly from a heart attack. The next time Javid was arrested for sodomy was in 1992, but this time his father's wealth and standing in the community could not save him. The police not only beat him to a pulp, but threatened to kill him and cover up his death. His mother tried her best by trying to bribe the police to let him go, but in Pakistan, a woman has not a tenth of the value a man has, and her pleas for his release were ignored. Javid was sentenced to a public thrashing, which was not only humiliating, but extremely painful. He was also sentenced to six months in prison, during which time he was so brutally attacked and beaten that he likely had a skull fracture, would suffer from back problems, and would have a limp as a result of the violence rained upon him. To Javid, the worst was that while he was in custody, his mother suffered a heart attack, and this would be the catalyst for his vengeance. He firmly believed the world had to pay with the blood of 100 boys to avenge the death of his mother, which he believed was the fault of the government. The humiliation and feeling of defeat would just fester as he blamed everyone except himself for his mother's death. It would peak in 1998 when there was an altercation between a masseuse and in an underage boy and himself and the police were called yet again. During the fight, Javid had his head kicked in and his wallet with all his rubles were stolen. But instead of charging the attackers for assault and theft, Javid was once again charged with a case of sodomy. His fury fueled his feelings of revenge and now there were no consequences. 
that could keep him from committing one of the worst serial murders in the history of Asia. The attack against him left him so injured he had to spend three weeks in hospital. None of his family members were willing to foot the bill. Thus, his home and his car were sold to cover his medical bills. For the first time in his life, Javid was without money. The 42-year-old sex offender still had four boys who were loyal to him, and when he was released from hospital, he decided to set his plan in action to rape, torture, and kill exactly 100 boys. The group had to move from the luxury of a villa with a pool to a dingy three-bedroom apartment at 11 Ravi Street, which is where so many children would be murdered. His killing spree would begin a couple of months after he was released from hospital. He would use his boys to lure children to the death chamber by promising them food or a piece of bread. Once the children were in his home, he would ask them about their lives, take a photograph, and then he and his accomplices would begin raping and killing the children. In 1999, an alarming number of boy children started to disappear from the streets of Lahore. Usually, the young beggars would not be noticed if they vanished, but when dozens upon dozens started to go missing, the authorities could not ignore the phenomenon. These orphans and runaways would not in general be looked for individually, but the numbers were so high and constantly growing as they vanished, something had to be done. In the beginning of December 1999, Javid sent a letter to the police as well as the local newspaper confessing that he had not only raped, tortured, and murdered a hundred children, his victims were all between the ages of 6 and 16 years old, and he admitted to strangling them and then dismembering them and then had dissolved their bodies in acid. He even gave them his address as well as more information about how he murdered the children. The first time a policeman read the letter, he threw it in the rubbish bin because the claims were so outlandish. But the reporters were convinced where there is smoke, there is fire. The fact that Javid was already known as a sex offender amplified the need to investigate further. I am sure that in a country such as Pakistan, nothing is inconceivable. But what the police discovered in the ramshackle abode of the worst serial killer the country had seen would haunt them forever. He wrote in the letter that he would kill himself once the letter was reacted on, but this would not happen. In the letter, he claimed that he would often hold a mask with a mixture of arsenic and cyanide over the sleeping children's faces and kill them that way. The bodies of the victims would be cut up, dissolved as much as possible, and then disposed of down a sewer grate, which would eventually flow in the nearby Ravi River. He claimed in the letter that he wanted to make a hundred mothers cry, the way his mother cried when he was convicted. He claimed that it took him about six months to complete this task, and, as predicted in the letter, the clothes, shoes, photographs, and relevant information were all neatly stacked in one of the rooms. But of all the things police uncovered, the metal chain that strangled a hundred boys would be the most haunting. Police realized if the letter was true and the contents of the house in the slum area contained the evidence they suspected it would, they were dealing with a man who had killed more victims than any serial killer currently confirmed in the United States of America. I would like us all to just take a moment and think about the enormity of this case. Anyone who had been to the funeral of a child knows that there is something almost unnatural to bury someone who has never had a childhood to begin with, let alone an adult life. 100 boys did not have a proper send-off, with small coffins draped with flowers and loved ones who mourned their loss. They were mostly just lost to the world long ago, 
and the tragedy of the way they died and were disposed of is chilling. Each child had a life, had hopes and dreams, and yet they were treated like rubbish. They were supposed to be protected, educated, nurtured, and instead, if the fate befalls a little soul in the third world, none of this will happen, and they would just become another statistic in a true crime episode. After breaking the padlock that locked the door of the apartment, the first of the senses that was assaulted was the sense of smell, with the stench of decomposition. Inside, the true horror of what 100 boys was revealed. The walls and other services were covered in blood. The chain with which Javid strangled his victims lay openly on the red-stained floor and Javid had taken photographs of each of the victims, written their names, ages, and the dates they died, and some of these pictures still had the blood of the victims on them. Some photos were on the wall, and some in plastic bags. But it was clear that the serial killer had made sure that the identity of each of his victims was known. He had left barrels of decomposing corpses for the police to find as they soaked in their chemical graves. Javit had also left behind a journal in which his last entry read, My count has reached 100. He was a handsome 16-year-old boy from Peshawar. With the grace of God, my mission is complete. Tears roll down my cheeks. I will make sure that my mission and my message reaches the world. His journal gave an insight to the trauma he exerted on his young victims. The unassuming little house with only two rooms suddenly became an ominous house of death. Although the house appeared to be the same as the others, with its bare brick walls and windows, the smell, once you approached the dwelling, was unbearable. The humble belongings of the perpetrator were only a bed and a television. Next to the bed was a table with three journals stacked upon each other, detailing his diabolical deeds. It was in the second room that the police discovered two large drums and containers with a potent chemical solution. What also confused police and reporters were the bags of children's shoes and clothing they found in some of the rooms. The two drums contained what police would later discover to be hydrochloric acid and the remains of Javid's last victims. Next to his bed, he had left three journals, which in his mind was an attempt to explain his deplorable acts. According to some sources, there was a plaque that read, The bodies in the house had purposefully not been disposed of, so that authorities can find them. He also claimed that the murders were committed in protest of the conditions in prison and the police brutality he suffered. In his letter, he claimed with his mission being now complete, he was going to drown himself in the Ravi River. But Javid was a coward, and after dragging the river with a net, no sign of him was found. Thus, the largest manhunt in Pakistani history was launched. Four teenage boys, likely used to lure Javid's prey, were arrested in his apartment. Days after the boys' capture, one of them died, with police claiming that he had jumped to his death from a window. There were rumors that the police had caused the death of the boy and had covered it up by claiming he committed suicide. But the shock and horror of the crimes and evidence completely overshadowed any investigation into the death and the cause of death was officially stated as suicide. Parents of children who had been reported as missing had the grim task of going through the evidence to see if their children were amongst the victims but many murdered boys would remain unclaimed. The newspaper, the Daily Yang, did not hold back and published crime scene photographs as well as those of the suspect. As more and more details were revealed, the community's blood began to boil 
and cries for vengeance were now directed at the perpetrators, especially Javed. Anyone associated with him, from his friends to his family, were detained and grilled for information, but Javed managed to hide for almost an entire month. It was only when two teenagers finally came to the police station and conf confessed to helping Javid hide that the police discovered he had been hiding in a drainage pipe and then in a cave. Javid, likely knowing his days were numbered, finally surrendered on the 30th of December 1999 after a month of hiding like a rat from the consequences he was to face. He entered the office of a newspaper, bedraggled, filthy, caked in mud, and with raggedy clothes, and surrendered himself. His chilling statement on entering proclaimed, I am Javed Iqbal, killer of a hundred children. I hate this world. I am not ashamed of my actions, and I am ready to die. I have no regrets. I killed a hundred children. I could have killed 500 children, but the pledge I had taken was to kill 800 children. The reason he went to the newspaper was because he was petrified that the police would kill him and torture him on the spot. He was immediately taken to the police station by the army and put into jail. Javid certainly had reason to fear the wrath of the Pakistani judicial system. Time was not wasted in dispensing justice. During the trial, Javid remained unremorseful and constantly contradicted himself. He also, despite all the evidence and his own written confession, tried to make himself into the victim of a police conspiracy. He even tried to convince the court that some of the victims had just run away again and were not murdered, as he wrote in his letters and journals. The court found him guilty on all 100 counts of murder, and everyone expected Javid to just serve a lifelong sentence, but the judge was so disgusted, he got creative with his sentence. On the 14th of March, 2001, the judge ordered that Javid would die the way he killed. He would repeatedly be strangled with the same chain he killed his victims with. His body would then be chopped up in 100 pieces, and dissolved in the same chemical composition he decided to dispose of his victims with. The sentence would be fulfilled in a public park for all to see, especially by all the parents of his victims. Justice Ramjet had no mercy for the child killer. Javid immediately appealed the conviction and claimed that he had fabricated all the evidence and that the entire confession was fiction. He protested that he made the entire crime up to draw attention to the plight of the street children of Lahore, and that he had made all the evidence up from Western detective books. The appeal failed, and he was sentenced to death, along with the eldest of his accomplices, in the manner the judge had originally decided. The younger two boys got between 120 years in prison to 60 years in prison, for these sentences, the judge had taken into account how young the offenders were. Justice Raja maintained that the punishment for Javid and the oldest boy was in accordance with Islamic rule, and he would maintain his verdict. This was, however, not in alignment with the Quran, and the higher authorities tried to stop the sentence. But in the end, it would not matter, despite the intervention of the clergy and the president. Javid would not be able to face his execution, and he hanged himself with his co-conspirator on the 8th of October 2001, after spending a year and a half in prison. The two cowards took their lives by hanging themselves in their cells instead of facing the sentence the judge had visited upon them. The two had hanged themselves with their bedsheets from their prison bars in the early hours of the morning. It was not his first attempt but this time, judging by their bulging eyes and protruding tongues, they had succeeded. The night watchman got such a fright and was so in fear of his own life after discovering the bodies, 
He brought them down and tucked them back into bed as it as if it nothing had happened. Needless to say, the ruse did not work, and the night watchman was fired on the spot. During the autopsy, foul play was suspected. Both men were bleeding from the nostrils, and there were wounds from a blunt instrument around the head. Regardless, the deaths were both listed as suicides by hanging. Since then, there have been efforts made to protect the street children of Lahore, but as with in all third world countries, it will never be enough. Nonprofit organizations and even the government itself have tried to put programs in place, but it's too little too late for most of the street children of Lahore. If you live in a first world country, it's difficult to understand the staggering numbers of those who are deemed as invisible and hopeless. But the next time you see a child wandering the streets aimlessly, think twice and perhaps even report the incident. For all you know, you might just be saving a life. This episode was written by Penny Morris. I'm going to leave you with a TED Talk by Annika Lucas, who describes her journey from having been trafficked as a child in the sex trafficking industry to her triumph in overcoming the after effects. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now. I'm from Belgium, but in my late teens, I escaped from there. And I ran off to France, then I went west. Went to England first, then I went to New York. Then I escaped further to the west coast of the United States, landed in Los Angeles. And after a few years there, I was getting antsy and I wanted to escape again. And I realized if I was going to go any farther west, I was going to end up in the Far East. So the journey outward, the escape, was over. And I realized I have to go in. I have to face myself. So I began a journey that lasted 30 years. That was an absolutely epic journey, facing dark death around every corner, confronted with large crevices that I had to jump into and know that something greater than my little ego was there to catch me. At times, I felt the pain of all the world. But after 30 years, I came out victorious. I was able to just be me. I was lucky to have a sense of what that might mean. Me. As a baby, I was raised by a psychopathic mother. And, you know, we're all born the same. We're completely cute, innocent, sweet. And we need that reflection of ourselves as little human beings to live. And I was not receiving that from my mother, but there was a caretaker who did give me that. And I remember very strongly, she wrapped me against her body with makeshift wraps. It was before we all held our babies in front of us. Taking care of the other babies, but holding me and feeling what it felt like to just be me. Now, she was there in the first three years. My mother then sold me, when I was six, to a group of psychopaths. They were very well-organized psychopaths. They were 
not just in Belgium, there were men from all over the world. And I found out much later that many of these men had very visible places on the world stage. They were world leaders, politicians, leaders of countries. And then there were those who controlled the world leaders together in this club. And they performed their the darkest things imaginable. And I experienced and witnessed this from the age of six to 11, when I was rescued from someone from the inside. Today, I work in jails and prisons in New York, where I now live, and I have an organization called Liberation Prison Yoga. I can relate to everyone because incarcerated people tend to be traumatized just where they are, and they often also have a lot of trauma in their past, often of the same degree of violence that I survived, without the privilege that I had to spend 30 years focusing just on healing. And then I also relate to people who come to train with me, to go into the prisons with me. And when I started to share my story in 2013, when I came to the end of that 30-year period, I was interviewed and then I started to speak. However, today is the first time I'm back in Europe speaking about this. What we create with Liberation Prison Yoga is um, an example of what the world could be like, like perhaps here today, where all of us really want to change the world for the better. Now, we are in the atomic age. We've already moved on into spiritual practices, and most of us know that we are not just this finite body, that we have these inner journeys, and those are very real. But somehow, the world seems to be more chaotic and darker than ever. So, who's going to win? The light or the dark? Light is consciousness. So, we need awareness. Awareness of the reality of the darkness that this world is ruled by psychopaths. And I think generally we don't really know what psychopaths are, and we can't really recognize them. You know, one way to tell someone who seems too good to be true, whether it's in your love relationships, or whether it's in politics. It's someone who plays at being human and makes it seem so simple and usually appears like a better version of ourselves, where we, with all these messy feelings, feel we want to emulate them and be more like that. Whether it's celebrities or whomever we put at the top of this top-down model. This top-down model is a trauma-based model. At the top are the psychopaths, the sickest people, and at the bottom are the vulnerable populations, the prisoners, the poor. And then in the middle, are most of us who are absolutely traumatized by this system, and at the same time, maybe seek to do good in the world. So, the best way to find the monster is to go within. 
about psychopaths is I was talking about the little baby before. Well, the psychopath is a person who didn't get to experience that innocence because their caregivers were already projecting, so there was no reflection of themselves as that innocent, cute little baby, which, as it were, banned them from themselves because it is feeling that makes us human. It is feeling that leads to consciousness, and it is my journey through feeling that has made me increasingly aware of myself, and as a result, and reflection, aware of what's outside as well. And I don't think any of us truly escape, because. The model in which we live itself makes it really impossible for parents to be unconditionally present for their children. And the younger the child, the more everything is life and death. So, if you're told by the doctor you need to let your baby cry it out and not to listen when it sounds torturous, well, it sounds torturous because the baby. Feels torture, and it is being traumatized in that moment. So on our journey in, yes, yoga and meditation are great practices to become mindful, to get a different perspective of ourselves. Very important, but we can't do that and then bypass the feeling part. We're all a little bit brainwashed into this thinking that the rational thinking is more important than feeling. I say it's probably equally important. We want to balance them out, but there's not really a lot known about someone's trauma journey. We don't really generally recognize behaviors and can guess that this started with a particular trauma that can be read in someone's behavior. We can read people's minds more easily because we ourselves have gone through trauma after trauma. So trauma is fear of death, fear of losing the physical body or the body of a loved one. So in that moment of fear of death, all brain activity recedes to the survival brain, which is right around the brainstem. All other brain activity stops. What's around the brainstem? Well, I spent a lot of time in that state. We're not human in that state, and psychopaths without feeling are in that state all the time, and then they have a cortex over it to hide it. And so, I've never seen an abuser that I didn't know was. Himself abused as a child because I, in my real job, which was attuning with the abuser and giving them what they needed, what they truly needed, I got this image of the little boy who was vulnerable, made themselves vulnerable to me, the child sex slave, so that that vulnerability was completely controlled. And if I hadn't given them what they truly needed, if I'd followed my impulse and perhaps laughed, or at them, or whatever they were afraid of, then I would have been killed, and there would be no witness to that vulnerability, that sense of humiliation, a repeat of the abuse, the feelings around the abuse that are all repressed. So, for someone who has zero healing at all, the best way. To get it out of the system because it is there and it needs to get out, is to go in that same mode: fight, flight, freeze, collapse, and in that barbaric, primordial state, to go into the fight mode and get that temporary release. If we're in trauma and we can fight, we can kill the predator, or we can run. Then all we have to do is take a few breaths, and the trauma would be out of our body-mind system. But as a child, we go into freeze, 
and everything is frozen. Now these men, some the most evil in the world, I'm pretty sure, were like parents to me. And there were some who gave me some reflections that I needed for my own emotional development. And so I loved them. So I try to understand, because I know that no one is truly a monster. But of course, psychopaths behave like monsters. I like to think of them as dinosaurs in business suits. They are antiquated, because we are already in an age where we move away from matter as the final reality. And if you have no access to feeling, you are relegated to the world of matter, to yourself, the body as the final person who you are. And so they're very heavily into rejuvenation. And the ways that they do that, I will spare you. But it's very barbaric. So, in my work today, I get a chance to do the same as I was made to do as a child, having moved through this vast regions, regions and regions of the emotional world, to come back to myself, free from guilt, and free to just whatever the universe sends my way. Now, if we look at society for a moment and we think that if we want to climb the ladder, the societal ladder, it tells you not to feel trauma. And the higher you go, the more you will be asked to give up your principles. And Usually, there's some sex scandal along the way up, whether it's in the corporate world or it's in the yoga world, that needs to be kept under wraps. And if you don't want to be quiet about it, you get kicked out. And you don't get to be part of the club. And at the very top, of course, are the people who are the most sick with trauma. So when a psychopath kills a baby, they are reliving that trauma story of when they were a little baby and they felt deadened. So they don't know it, but they're repeating their trauma story. The great thing about the journey inward... Now, it was completely invisible. I had a few safe people. But the great thing about it is that we don't have to travel to do it. You can do it right here and now. It's difficult to hear about the reality of the darkness of the world, because it requires for us to go through some feelings, perhaps, that are traumatic. The shock and disbelief, the anger, the landing of the reality and the pain that comes with that, and perhaps the grief, the disgust, it's not easy, but I've been amazed at how receptive audiences are. And I can tell you that it's been a challenge to stand here, back in Europe today, and feel heard, and allowing myself to feel the healing. So. Have a pleasant journey, and may we all be victorious.